The year is 1999 and Elon Musk has just sold his first software company Zip2 for a whopping $400 million. Just a large number of Ben Franklin's. You can see the elation here on his face as he just buys a McLaren F1, one of less than 70 in the world, and he has bright prospects for the future, investing that money in another company. Now, if you walked past Elon on the street at that time, it would be tough to imagine that he would go on to be someone who dates actresses, models, and becomes a real life Tony Stark. But he's really lent in to his fame and uh, really metamorphosis, going on to buy Twitter and just becoming the persona which you can see there today. Now, a growing body of evidence may suggest why that small taste of fame uh, made some neurobiological changes to his brain that made his future success even more likely. And some of those changes may not be as advantageous as we might think. So in this video, I'm gonna go through those uh, and speak about the evidence base behind it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Saramed and I am a doctor working in London. I make videos on celebrity health to try and help us learn from their experiences. If that's something you're into, hit subscribe so you can stay informed. Now back in the mid 2000s, a group of researchers from Stanford examined the African brackish and found a school of fish uh, known as the cichlids. What's interesting about this school of fish is that the non-dominant male is this drab, torp, dull color. Now, as soon as this male is given an opportunity to get some land and to be able to mate, it starts to transform. It becomes this neon, blue or yellow color, starts to attract more and more attention. And other fish start to see this fish with a higher social standing. It shimmers aggressively with its new color to rivals and mates alike that's ready to fight or procreate. And what's interesting is that this new color will be able to give this fish more opportunity. When you test the brain, neurobiological changes happen in this fish that make it change its behavior. What's even more interesting is that this adoration for high status animals isn't just present under the sea. In 2005, Dr. Platt and Dr. Robert Dana examined the monkeys. Now, the monkeys were placed uh, in a room and they were taught that if they looked to the right, they got a squirt of delicious, uh, sweet cherry juice. And if they looked to the left, they got a smaller squirt. But they also got a bonus and that was to see one of two things either a high status monkey or um, a picture of a female monkeys behind, which is sort of like uh, animal adult content. So time and time again, repeatable results showed that the monkey would be more likely to look left and take the smaller squirt if it were able to see the high status uh, monkey, just a picture of them which was very interesting. It's almost like a monkey pay-per-view. And this was one of the first documented evidence for that. This adoration can be translated to humans. And in fact, it's so powerful that even when we fake being a celebrity, we uh, can still get riches as a result of that. A notable example is Anna Sorokin, who was seen as the fake kingpin of New York, where she pretended to be the heiress of a billion dollar empire, trying to set up a design gallery in New York and get funding for it. She managed to get Wall Street bankers to give her over $200,000 when she faked having a lavish lifestyle. We see this time and time again with other series like Tinder Swindler, um, and many people abuse this natural neurobiological phenomenon of adoration to celebrities uh, to be able to get their own gain. But what is it like from the other side, being the celebrity? I think that's even more interesting because when you act on your work for a long time and people start to notice and recognize it, things really change. The ego begins to expand. 
and the person can gain a heightened sense of self-worth. Similar traits that you might see with narcissism and a clinical psychologist named Dr. Rockwell uh, actually created something called the phenomenology of a celebrity after examining 15 celebrities and she noted that as someone gets more famous they actually begin to care less about others and become more absorbed in their own narrative. There's only one Zlatan. Are you sure? Yeah. Now what's interesting is because of this neurobiological predilection to appreciate and adore the celebrities, we may let that behavior pass. He's never seen referee in the country. I don't even deserve PZ should be in this country. But the truth is that success is not a reason to treat people badly and we should not stand for it. But what's interesting is that when we see a celebrity who has success also be humble, then we adore them even more. So uh, you might see, for example, uh, Russell Brand, who was quite a famous comedian, now is becoming a lot more introspective and humble and he's started to gain a huge amount of following. With over 5 million subscribers uh, on YouTube and I quite respect the work he's done. Now what's, what's also interesting is the chemical changes that happen within the brain that govern this behavior. But don't trust me on that because why would you trust a random person on the internet? And you would be right to ask that question because you shouldn't. But what you should do is trust someone with evidence. And there is a clinical psychologist specializing in celebrity care named Dr. Rockwell. And she created a document in 2009 called The Phenomenology of Celebrities. In that document, she raised some interesting points. Uh, now, as I mentioned before about the celebrities sometimes starting to care less about others as part of that and as part of being in the eye for so long it becomes very isolating not being able to go outside having to hide uh, because as Tom Hanks says it walking down the street as a celebrity is like having a skunk inside your head because of all the way people who turn to look so it can't all be positive but there are some phases uh, that celebrities go through, which Dr. Rockwell suggests from her study of these 15 uh, different celebrities in different fields. And the first phase is the love-hate phase. Some never get past that phase, like Megan Fox, for example, who mentions that being a celebrity is like having a million people bullying you all at the same time uh, and have really quite a negative experience of that, couldn't handle it. When you get past that love-hate phase, you move on to the next phases, which are addiction, acceptance, and adaptation to the new ways of life. And what's interesting is that when you get that first initial rush of euphoria and elation, the, the chemicals inside your brain would start to increase the endorphins, the dopamine, uh, the serotonin, and your body starts to almost become addicted to that feeling. As a result of that heightened state, eventually, it becomes not enough. In a similar way that someone who takes drugs for the first time will start to need more and more to get the same rush. And then when you drop the amount of drug, they can sometimes withdraw and feel horrible. Right? Celebrity status can have a similar impact. And I think that's part of the reason why so many celebrities turn to drugs and alcohol to try and mimic that same rush that they got and became so used to What's even more difficult is when you fall out of the spotlight. For example, we saw this with my recent video on Madonna, where she does everything that she can to try and stay there. Um, and it's because everyone wants to be relevant and to be adored, but some have adapted. Now, Dr. Rockwell gives an example of this in her phenomenology paper, where she mentions walking into a, a wedding and seeing an old R&B star. And the R&B star was telling her about the experiences she gets when people recognize her on the street. And they say, hey, didn't you used to be dot dot dot? Because she can't reveal the identity of the person. And ultimately it, that fame goes away, but there was a craving for what once was. 
She mentions that you can't stay in the bright light of fame at its original luminosity forever. But what's, what's interesting in looking at all of this, I think that there are caveats to that. And it totally depends how the person gained their notoriety. There's being famous for the right reasons and being famous for the wrong reasons. You could say type one or type two fame. You say type one fame, as my theory goes, would be the person who gets famous for something that's temporary or fleeting, like being attractive or um, a song which goes viral or a YouTube video, for example. And then the type two fame, which is something that could be everlasting and sustainable, would be someone who creates services for mankind based on values and principles, uh, things that are universal laws that are everlasting, like generosity, um, environmentalism, and uh, conservation. And someone like Elon Musk, for example, who is fighting to be able to progress mankind would be able to stay in the spotlight for so long because of that solid grounds that he created before becoming famous. He stayed consistent with his values and principles over a long period of time. So fame in itself is not a goal. Just as Russell Brand says it, what is fame really except millions of people that you don't know having an opinion about you? And that's it's really something to think about. And it shouldn't be a goal in itself uh, because of all the reasons and neurobiological changes that we've mentioned. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, I would love to hear your opinion on fame and the science behind it down in the comment section below. Is fame something you want or would you prefer to stay more low key in this uh, oversharing internet age that we live in? So. Uh, if you found this video interesting, you may find this video on Elon Musk's Asperger syndrome interesting. So take a look at that and I will see you in the next video. Stay healthy, stay happy. I'm Sarah Mind.